Uh, hi, uh, my name is Kevin Bankston, and welcome to the panel on National Security Letters. Um, I am director of something called the Open Technology Institute at New America, which is a think tank and advocacy shop in Washington, D.C. that works on issues of digital civil liberties and human rights, uh, free speech, surveillance, things like that. Um, I previously worked uh, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation with this uh, young man, uh, Kurt Opsahl, who is the uh, deputy executive director and general counsel of that esteemed organization. Uh, on my far right, we're joined by Christina Rudy, who is a local defense attorney uh, with an interest and passion on this issue. Uh, and to my left, we have yeah. Blair Chintella, also a local uh, lawyer, a general practitioner with expertise in constitutional law and internet uh, law as well. So where to begin? This story really begins, as so many awful stories do, with the USA Patriot Act in 2001 passed up after 9-11. Um, national security le letters existed before then, but the USA Patriot Act turbocharged them. I'm gonna give you a brief explanation of what national security letter letters are, and then my esteemed panelists are going to uh, chime in to talk about the abuses we've seen from these tools uh, over the past 15 years, the legal challenges uh, to, to those uh, tools, and I will uh, close it out with a discussion of current threats in Congress to actually make this thing, the National Security Letter, even more invasive. So what is a National Security Letter? A National Security Letter is an administrative subpoena. What the hell is an administrative subpoena? Um, well, there are these things called subpoenas, which are like court orders, but they're very easy to get. Uh, they're nominally you know, under the authority of a court, but usually they're issued directly by a prosecutor. Um, but then there are these other things called administrative subpoenas, which are not even nominally under the supervision of a court. They are just issued directly by someone. In this case, the local agent in charge of your FBI office. Um, so it's a very, uh, it's an authority that lots and lots of FBI agents can use, where they're basically just writing a letter, national security letter, to uh, a provider of communication service asking for a bunch of information. Why is this a concern? Well, it's a concern because there's no oversight of it from a court. There's concern because this is so easy to get and it can reach an enormous amount of information, not only your name and address and how you're paying for the service and whatnot, but also any of the phone records associated with that account. Um, and in the context of the internet, although this is subject to uh, uh, controversy right now, uh, information about who you are communicating with and when and how often and how big the files are and et cetera, et cetera. Basically, any kind of electronic communications transactional record that isn't actually the content of what you're saying to somebody. So it's a wide breadth of information uh, that could reveal an enormous amount about uh, you know, your political leanings, your religious leanings, your, your interests, your friendships, your network, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is even more concerning because the letter is attached with a gag order, uh, a statutory demand saying you cannot tell anyone that you ever received this letter asking for your customer's records. Um, and indeed, uh, as of 2001, and until it was sorted out a few years later, it was even unclear whether or not you could speak to a lawyer about whether and how you should comply with the request. And so the people who would receive these, these letters, especially if they were smaller, uh, service providers like uh, Nicholas Merrill, the gentleman who was on the Democracy Now! clip we were showing, were completely flummoxed. Like, what the hell do I do with this? They're asking me to hand over all these records. I don't even know if I can talk to a lawyer about it, you know, much less anyone else. Um, and so what the USA Patriot Act did was took this tool that had been limited to getting the records of suspected terrorists and spies and broadened it so that it could be used to obtain any records that the FBI deemed relevant to a criminal or terrorist investigation, which is a much broader net. And if you followed any of the controversies coming out of the Snowden revelations around the abuse of another type of legal process called a 215 order from the FISA court, um, at some point uh, the DOJ considered everybody in the country relevant to its investigations into terrorism. So not a great check on what the government could get here. So Patriot expanded this power. It was set to sunset in a couple of years. It didn't. It's been renewed regularly every few years. 
uh, since then. But luckily, there has been a lot of new information coming out about NSLs and challenges to NSLs and attempts, sometimes successful, to reform the law around NSLs. So I'm going to hand it over to Kurt to talk about how we've been proceeding in the courts uh, when it comes to this authority. Sure, sure. So, uh, so uh, my organization, the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation, uh, has been very concerned for a long time about the national security letter power. And we have uh, represented uh, a number of uh, entities who have received uh, uh, national security letters in challenging them in the court. Uh, so because of the uh, uh, secrecy surrounding it, uh, actually can only uh, identify one of those uh, clients, which was the uh, Internet Archive, uh, who received a national security letter in uh, 2007. Uh, which we uh, we challenge. You guys familiar with the Internet Archive, archive.org? It's an online library. Uh, there's actually an exception for libraries uh, in the NSL statute. Uh, so uh, the archive challenged it both on that it wasn't applicable because it was a library and for constitutional reasons. Uh, that matter settled, uh, so uh, uh, it didn't get to a, a ruling uh, by the court, but it did allow for the archive to uh, to talk about having having received one. Uh, and then for the last several years, uh, I've been representing two uh, unnamed uh, companies who are uh, who are challenging. Uh, the national security letter provision. They were, were served with national security letters. Um, and, you know, it's a very weird thing that uh, uh, it, to be representing somebody and you can't, like, say who they are. Uh, and we have public hearings and, you know, to the extent that the clients come to the, the courtroom, you know, they have to do so uh, uh, quietly and uh, uh, make sure it's not clear who they are. Um, so, I'll tell you a little bit about what the what the legal challenges are. So uh, we'll start off with sort of a basic provision, you know, under the First Amendment and under our constitutional system, uh, uh, prior restraints are considered to be uh, a big problem. That if you uh, uh, restrain somebody from speaking, that's a much bigger deal than if you hold them responsible after the fact for what they have said. Uh, and so courts on the whole don't allow for prior restraint saying that, you know, first, in the first instance, you're allowed to speak. And then, uh, you know, if it turns out uh, there, there's an issue with what you said, uh, we'll deal with that later. But this is an example of a, uh, of a prior uh, restraint, a censorship regime. Um, and so there's some very strict uh, rules uh, about when that can happen. And, you know, we don't, we don't believe that the, uh, the statutory gag uh, meets those, those standards. Uh, I mean, as an initial matter, uh, it, it doesn't come from a court. Uh, so they, um, the FBI, uh, several levels of officials at the FBI can sign these letters. It goes down to, uh, at the lowest level, the special agent in charge of a field office can, can sign the letter. Uh, and then it has the uh, the force of law in order to gag. Um, and so uh, the, one of the big bases for the challenge is uh, it's a procedural issue uh, that you can't do it that way, that actually the government needs to go to a court to get a gag. Uh, and the key case on that is a case called uh, Friedman. Um, and under the, the, the Friedman case was a, a film censorship case where the Maryland, this Friedman versus Maryland, and the Maryland Board of Censors uh, got to uh, uh, censor films before they were shown uh, in, in a theater. Uh, so you had to ask the Board of Censors, hey, can I show this film? And then they would eventually you know, get around to saying yes or no. Um, and uh, Friedman challenged this not uh, about a specific decision saying no, but that the whole process was flawed of having to go get a license before you were allowed to speak. And it identified uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, problems um, that, uh, that he was gagged until they, they reached a ruling, which could be an indefinite period of time, um, that there was no assurance that they would even come to any, a ruling uh, quickly, um, and it was his burden to, to challenge it, not the government's. Uh, and so the Supreme Court uh, agreed with these problems, 
that uh, it had to be the uh, uh, the government's burden to uh, to go forward and, and get a, a gag order that uh, any gag prior to a court ruling had to be for a, a, a brief specific period of time um, that there would be a prompt review uh, and also, you know, a substantive uh, a review uh, taking account of the First Amendment factors. Uh, and so this was the, the, the basis of uh, challenges to, to the NSLs. And the, uh, the government had some workarounds for this they were trying to put forward. Uh, so they said, well, okay, so it is, uh, uh, they don't want to take the burden of going to the court first. Because, you know, they, they issue probably uh, at this point over 400,000 NSLs. Uh, if they had to go to the court to get a gag on each one, you know, they, they uh, find that very burdensome. Um, you know, this, this is actually, I think, a price of our, our judicial system. Uh, the, the idea is that we make it burdensome before the government can gag people and keep from them speaking, but nevertheless, they want to do it. And so their workaround is uh, what they call reciprocal notice. So uh, uh, just tell us if you're interested in, in challenging it, and then we'll go to the court. Uh, and, and get a court-ordered gag. Um, and the, the effect of this is, is quite pernicious uh, because uh, a lot of the uh, telecommunications providers are not that interested in making waves and, and doing a thing, uh, so they're not going to challenge it. The affected parties, the people whose information is being revealed, don't even know about them, so they're not in a position to challenge it. Uh, and so uh, we've had you know hundreds of thousands of NSLs and you know less than a dozen challenges. Um, now, fortunately, uh, in, in, in our case, there were uh, these two uh, service providers who were interested in, in challenging the order, and we were able to uh, take, that, uh, take that forward. So uh, in uh, 2000, um, I guess it was 2013, uh, we got a, a ruling uh, from a, uh, a district court, a federal district court, uh, that it was unconstitutional under these, these sort of Freedmen grounds. Uh, and then, of course, the, the government uh, appealed, um, argued that, that appeal, uh, and then while uh, that, that appeal was pending, um, there was the, the USA Freedom Act, which made some changes to the uh, NSL statute. So the appeals court said, okay, we need to do a do-over under the new language of the statute. So it went back down to the, uh, the district court, um, and, and this time the court said, well, we think that these changes are, are enough, which we strongly disagree with, um, that uh, uh, the, the changes are, are uh, not very uh, uh, additionally protective, uh, still has this reciprocal notice schema, uh, and has the possibility of a perpetual gag. Uh, and so now it is back before the appeals court, uh, and actually this, uh, this week uh, we've been uh, writing our, our briefs to uh, submit uh, to the appeals court and uh, hopefully uh, can uh, get it uh, uh, struck down uh, as a unconstitutional gag and at least require that before someone can be prevented from speaking, before a service provider can say, uh, sorry, can be prevented from even saying that they have received a national security letter, uh, that the government has to go to a, a court. And I want to just point out uh, Ninth Circuit. Yep. Yes. So what we've been doing in, in the case is as we go along, uh, we have negotiated with the government about redacted versions of our brief. So EFF.org, uh, search like EFF NSL and you'll, you'll find the pages and uh, they will, the legal arguments are by and large, uh, you can see those, uh, but facts that would be necessary or you know, specific to the companies are redacted. Uh, and this is a bit of a slow process, so like we have to write the brief and then go back and forth with the government over what, what can be uh, uh, revealed. So there's a delay between uh, when we file it and when it becomes public, but at least all the ones from you know, a year ago or more, they're all up in, in some kind of redacted form. Uh, so I say they want one of the other uh, issues that sort of is running through this is there's a trend amongst service providers to provide transparency reports. It's a good trend, help people understand what the government is doing with the service providers. <coughs> but the service providers 
who receive an NSL are prohibited from saying so. Uh, so they cannot be honest with their customers. And the, the argument that the government has is, well, you know, national security, we need to keep this secret. But I mean, seriously, the, the fact that, you know, a, a large service provider like receives national security letters doesn't tell a, a you know, prospective terrorist really anything. Uh, and then they have a system where you are allowed to say, oh, we've gotten between zero and 249 national security letters. You have to put the zero in there to create the sort of, you know, Schrodinger's NSL where you're not sure if it exists or not. Uh, but like, it comes to a funny situation where like, there was one uh, a company that had a transparency report and it said NSL zero, NSL zero, NSL zero, NSL zero to 249. Can you figure out what happened there? Uh, but of course they have to say it's possible that it's just uh, uh, zero. Thanks, Kurt. So <laughs> there's a lot of concern about these NSLs, which are very powerful, being abused, especially shrouded in the secrecy uh, that Kurt's been litigating against. And, um, you know, groups like the ACLU, like the EFF, others have been advocating for NSL reform for a long time, usually in the context of whenever this provision and several others would come up for sunset in Congress, where Congress would need to renew these authorities. And they always do. But once in a while, we're able to get some reforms or at least some accountability. And, and one way we were able to do that was in 2003, uh, we were able to get a provision into the renewal that required an inspector general report. These are sort of like ombudsmen for the agencies, independent uh, overseers who can do reports on how these things are being used. And what those reports over the years have revealed is a disturbing pattern of extensive abuse of this authority. And that's not me saying that, that's the Inspector General of the Justice Department saying that. But so first off is just the scale of how much these are used. In 2003 to 2005, which was the subject of the first IG report in 2007, there were 200,000 NSLs issued in over those uh, few years. Um, but then again, that doesn't mean there were only 200,000 targets. There was probably more on the order of about a million targets because often the letters include many targets. Um, some of them include so many targets that the IG was really uncomfortable. For example, they had one, one national security letter that, that targeted 4,000 different telephone numbers. Um, so this is operating at an enormous scale and some would argue that you know, if you're talking about, say, on the order of a million people every few years, are there really that many people actually relevant to terrorism and espionage investigations in the U.S.? That's a whole lot of people. But even with this extensive power, the FBI would still go around it or go around other authorities. So, for example, and, and Kurt knows this story well, there was a period where the FBI, several of them were embedded with the telcos to get quick access mm -hmm. to the data they wanted from the phone companies. And they wouldn't even get the NSL. They'd have like sticky notes where they're like, we're going to get you an NSL for these numbers, but give them to us now. And so sticky notes replaced legal process for a while there. Um, uh, there are other instances where the FBI tried to get the FISA court to approve a court order for stuff. And the FISA court would say, no, your evidence is too thin or no, these records are protected by the First Amendment. And the FBI would go, OK. And then they'd go and write their own national security letter and get the records that way. So the FBI's track record here isn't that great. And there is continuing grave concern that these are going to be abused. I was wondering, Blair, could you talk more about, uh, in your perspective as a, as a practitioner, uh, the abuses you're worried about or have seen or cases that you think have been interesting? Um, I think you touched on the main one, which is the scope. So like with Nick Merrill's case, it so just- Nick Merrill is Nick Merrill was the first guy who filed a lawsuit against uh, to challenge the NSLs uh, back in 2004. And I, I passed out his NSL around, and most of you should have already seen it. Um, but after, it took 11 years for him to be able to even, well, six years for him to talk about it and disclose that he was even the recipient of an NSL. So and then it took 11 years for him to be able to disclose the attachment uh, to the NSL, which outlined the material that they were seeking, which is just basic information like date the account opened or closed, subscriber name and related subscriber information. So I think the key problem is the ability 
the practical ability of someone to challenge that. So in his case, it took 11 years through over a decade of his life to challenge this NSL that he felt he wanted to take a stand on principle about. I mean, how many people are going to do that considering there are hundreds of thousands of these going out each year? Um, so the government has a lot of resources to fight these things, and they're, they're worried about precedent. So, like, again, when it goes to court, they'll reach a settlement or even Congress uh, working in tandem with the FBI uh, will amend the statute so the case becomes moot. So it sort of avoids it ever coming to a constitutional issue of whether it's violating the First Amendment or Fourth Amendment. I mean, these started back in 2001, and there are a total of like two or three cases, uh, main cases that I've seen that even address these issues. And Kurt mentioned one that's still going on. It's 14 years later uh, since these really started to take an upscale. So um, that's what you get when you have secrecy, in my opinion, is just, you know, we need to have a more transparent process. Um, the FISA court is one idea, but even that's succumbed to sort of a over, you know, lack of transparency in that. So that's the primary issue that I see mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. Well, so, you know, this secrecy uh, clearly dissuades challenge, and Kurt noted that there have only been 12 challenges at uh, this point. I less than a dozen, actually. Less I'd have to think about the exact so number. So less than a dozen challenges when we're talking about just in the past 10 years, there have been 300,000 NSLs probably impacting on the order of a million people, and there have been 12 challenges. Not a system that actually encourages or makes it easy to challenge. But uh, another context where this data might come up uh, is as evidence in a criminal case. Uh, and so um, I'm wondering, Christina, can you speak to, as a defense attorney, your perspective on NSLs as a tool? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the problem that I have with national security letters is that as a defense attorney, whenever there's evidence that they're going to try and, to bring, try and bring into court against my client that they've obtained through a search warrant, I have access to us, a, but a bit of information about the justification for the search warrant. So I have an affidavit that is attached to that search warrant that says, well, this is what our investigation revealed, and this is why we believe that we're entitled to this information. And then a, a police officer or a detective or whomever goes before a magistrate and says, this is what I want, and the magistrate will evaluate it. And there's an opportunity there for that magistrate to say, look, you, you're, you're not going to get this information. There's just no justification here. And none of that happens with the national security letter. And in addition, nobody knows that it ever happened. They can't disclose it. Um, and so when it comes into court, I don't have, I, I wouldn't have a mechanism to challenge the admissibility of that evidence because it would be in violation of the 4th, 5th, 6th, 8th, and I think you could probably argue the 14th Amendment too. There's this whole array of constitutional protections that it just bypasses entirely, and those are very important protections. And and I can tell you in every criminal case that, that I've ever worked, we file motions to challenge search warrants and arrest warrants. It's extensively litigated, and the more serious the case is, the more extensively we litigate that. In the kinds of cases in which national security letters would actually wind up resulting in information uh, that somebody would attempt to admit in court, they would obviously be some of the most serious cases that would be before the court. We're talking about terrorism cases and or at least that's the intent behind the national security letters right they're not using these things to catch you know uh, drug dealers you know uh, selling some some marijuana on the street they're using them to to catch terrorists and those would be cases that uh, obviously require a high amount of uh, or, or that the defendant's constitutional rights be uh, scrupulously protected and, and it just bypasses all of that. Um, and that's a, a very grave concern to me as somebody who's entrusted with protecting, you know, my defendant's mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so please. Oh, I, I wanted to just uh, uh, add on a little bit uh, more. One, one of the interesting things about uh, the Nick Merrill case is in uh, this uh, about a year ago, uh, the, the gag was uh, uh, more fully lifted and it allowed uh, us to see, the public to see, 
um, what at that time the government thought was an electronic communication transaction record. So I'm going to sort of step back. In the statute, it says you know you can get your name, address, a couple other things, and electronic communication transactional records. And that term isn't sort of directly defined. Uh, and this this show, illustrates a problem with secret law where uh, the government can come up with an interpretation of that and did come up with that interpretation and then just send that out to the service providers without a court overseeing, without a court saying yes that is the correct interpretation uh, and then the service providers who you know, by and large are not challenging it might, might come up with a lot more things and we saw from uh, at least uh, uh, the uh, NSLs from that era that they had an extremely broad view of what an electronic communication transactional record was. Uh, they, they thought it could get a lot of different things. Now, they, they at least understood, because it's, it's pretty much directly in the statute, that it couldn't get to the content of communication. So, I mean, it is important to note that NSLs are not all powerful tools allowing you to get just anything whatsoever, but under the FBI's original interpretation, uh, it was an extremely broad thing beyond the scope of the statute. Now, eventually, um, within the government itself, uh, there, uh, the uh, Office of Legal Counsel, which is sort of like a, a bunch of attorneys who work for the Justice Department who, who interpret the law, they came out and actually rebuked the, the FBI's interpretation and said it had to be uh, ratcheted back. And I believe that was in, in 2008. But this means that for at least the first seven years, they were pushing this uh, expansive interpretation and there really wasn't much of a, of a check on, on what that interpretation uh, was. And then the, the, the next uh, uh, challenging thing is that, uh, so they've you know, changed their, their interpretation since then, uh, but the letter is, uh, is secret, so uh, you know, I can't tell you what's in the new uh, interpretation. Uh, and uh, you know, well, eventually we may be able to see that in the, in, in the public and, and you'll see if you think that they, they got it right this, uh, later. Read all the things? Oh, I can read some of, some of the things that were on that. Uh, I mean, some of the more uh, invasive ones: all website information registered to the account. Um, the uh, uh, let's see, the uh, materials are re records relating to merchandise orders and shipping. Uh, so, like what you're buying online, which you know that that goes beyond the the, the scope of the statute. Um, and I think probably the most evasive one any other information which you consider to be an electronic communication transactional record. So like, if, if you believe it, it's true apparently is their, their interpretation, you know. What happens to this data while it's being challenged in the few cases where it's being challenged? Um, so in, in the cases that, that I, where I've uh, represented, uh, well in the Internet Archive case, uh, the NSL was withdrawn and, and so the non-public information was not uh, provided. Um, in in the other two cases, uh, we sort of you know separately uh, challenge whether uh, the you know they could be compelled to provide this information without a, without a court order, whether that uh, was sufficiently protective of, of people's right to speak anonymously. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, that that was not successful, and so uh, I took that up and. Uh, to uh, both the, the appeals court and then we petitioned for the Supreme Court, but eventually they said you have to turn over the information. So uh, in, in the, for the two service providers that we're representing, the information requested was turned over. In all these cases you're mentioning, okay. in, uh, in all these cases you're mentioning, the NSL is address towards an ISP uh, who has data in the data center that some agency wants. Um, now the reason for that is because the intelligence agency can't get it themselves. Yet we know there's a separate effort where uh, there are optical taps placed on AT&T peering hubs. Uh, they use NARIS Insight data analyzers to do deep packet inspection. Uh, uh, the ad agency would not need data from, to, to, to have got their own data. And so my question is, uh, could you differentiate those two, and was an NSL used to compel AT&T to provide those data tabs? So I think you're talking about like room 641A in the Folsom Street facility? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, very, very familiar with that room. Um, the, the evidence there was actually suggesting uh, that that was uh, uh, to the NSA, not to the FBI. Uh, and uh, that, that is a separately problematic um, uh, program. 
uh, and as, as, as we understand it, uh, the um, initially uh, it was done through executive requests, I guess, under the, you know, the power of the executive without any uh, a law, law behind it. Uh, and then they they moved on uh, to get you know other other laws as it as it evolved you know, the president surveillance program as it, as it was called is that the jewel case or yeah yep yeah. that's the the jewel case actually Kevin uh, uh, you probably have some fond memories of all that uh, yes yes I, I worked a lot on the NSA cases at EFF back in the day it's still going on as I understand it which is one of the yeah, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> the joys of litigation. Oh, excuse me. No, it's a funny story. We sued AT&T in 2006. Congress killed that case in 2008, so we sued the NSA directly in 2008, and that case is still, still going. at least in, in some discovery now, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. okay. So, progress after after eight years. Uh, um, but it's, it's, I just also want to clarify uh, one of the problems with uh, the, um, the TAP program is that it was doing as a packet inspection it was looking at the content of the communications nsls don't don't get to content um so uh they get for you know what if used properly are getting to basic subscriber information uh even with their expansive interpretation of of the xr they're still excluding the content of communication so there is a separate problem with that uh, but I mean, so but you can imagine these two things working in tandem as well. If they're doing taps on the fiber and they see an interesting communication between two people that they don't know, they can use an NSL to get the subscriber interface of inter information of those accounts to try and identify them. Uh, or on the flip side, they can be crunching, you know, data that they got through NSLs to identify targets to then put on the list for the taps. You know, so they're they're somewhat different data that can work together. Um, so uh, just a, a, yeah, oh, oh, a quick a quick a quick poll since we're talking about the types of data. Like I'm curious if the two options. I'll, I'll ask you to raise your hands after saying what the two options are. The two options are the government wiretaps your phone calls for 30 days, or the government goes to Gmail and gets a log of everyone you've emailed and when for as long as you've had an account, and they go to your ISP to see all the websites you've been visiting. Which would you think is more invasive? Raise your hand if you think the wiretap would be more invasive. Not a one person. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think the records would be more invasive. All right. See, under current law, under the current view of the Fourth Amendment that the courts hold and have held for 40, 50 years or so, um, you're wrong. And actually, it is the content of your communications which deserves Fourth Amendment protection. In fact, very strong Fourth Amendment protection, such that not only do they have to get a warrant for it, they have to get a special wiretap order that's even more protective than a regular warrant, while your records are not protected by the Fourth Amendment at all. Um, that's a constitutional law matter, not a, a, a statutory law matter, but for example, if the courts thought those records were protected by the Fourth Amendment, it would be much easier for us to challenge this law as violating the Fourth Amendment. But right now, under this uh, third-party records doctrine, um, you have a much less of a constitutional interest in the privacy of records that a company holds about you as opposed to the contents of the communications that you actually are communicating. Yes, sir? Well, are you pretty much in your end-user license agreement kind of giving up your privacy interest in your personal information? The question is, uh, aren't you giving up your privacy interest in uh, your communications or your records in uh, terms of service with the provider. Kurt, you looked like you wanted to address that? I mean, I, I, I would dis uh, disagree with that. Um, I mean, I think that, that the, the argument has certainly been put forward by uh, the government in part that, you know, uh, well, their main argument is by putting their records with a third party whatsoever, uh, that, that you have uh, uh, given up your, your privacy interest in it. Uh, I have also seen the argument that, like, well, under this privacy policy, it said that if we got uh, a lawful order, we would hand it up. So you've given up your your uh, right to it. But I mean, keeping in mind that that uh, uh, terms of service and uh, end user license agreement, and so on, nobody actually really reads those. They are uh, part of what you click through in order to get to where you want. Uh, and like, 
we're trying to, to build a better future here, right? We want to have a future that we would want to live in, that we want our children to grow up in. And we want to have that future be where we've had a set of rules of protecting people's privacy uh, and security, protecting them from the government, protecting against the general warrants that the founders uh, were, were so opposed to, and just sort of say, well, because this pattern has emerged where people put their lives online and, and these private parties have service agreements, that we're going to just throw all that out the window and, and you know, come to a society where we don't have the, these things that we thought were very important. I mean, we did an experiment when, when creating this country. Could you have a, a country in which the government didn't have the ability to go into any door they wanted and look around to see if there's any evidence of a crime. Uh, and the price of that might be that they might not find the evidence of crime and a criminal gets away, but our founders thought that was better uh, for, for society. And I think we shouldn't give up that experiment. We have a, a question in the front. She's been waiting. Um, okay, I have so many questions, but I will limit <laughs> it to one. Uh, can, so once the NSL letter goes out and the ISP provider or um, whomever agrees to it, and they receive the data, can they then apply for a search warrant for the contents of those communications based on the transactional records that they got through the NFL? I would say so. Yeah. I, so would, I would challenge it, but <laughs> they could. I'm going I'm I'm to uh, take the opposite view. I actually right. think that uh, the government examining my telephone conversations is analogous to them looking inside my emails. And I consider that to be a lot more invasive because I have an expectation of privacy without due process on my conversations and my transmissions, whether you know through the internet or over my cell phones, however it's, it's transmitted. And I also think of this as analogous. We had a great session here on government uh, invasion of privacy during the um, early colonial times and how they were reading the mail just, I, I was astonished, they were reading the mail just normally. This is to me metadata. This is like, you know, on an envelope. And whether I call somebody, whether I go to a website, this is public information because I'm actually asking my ISP to route this and deliver this to me. I have no expectation of privacy because I'm going to a third party, I'm giving it up. If I want to get an ISIS newsletter and I want it delivered to me in the open and just the mailman, hundreds of people see that and they see that I'm getting an ISIS newsletter, I would expect the government would be able to take action on that. If I had, was getting an ISIS newsletter in a plain white envelope, I would not expect anybody to take action without due process. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm just being contrarian a little bit, but is this much to do about nothing? I mean, metadata, what is, what is private about metadata to transmit what I want transmitted by a third party? What's private about that? You know, I get on a flight on Monday, on Tuesday to Philadelphia, do I have an expectation of privacy about that? What's so, the difference? I mean, uh, first I'd say, I mean, I, I welcome your being contrary, and you're basically articulating the Justice Department's overall argument. I think that the way that many in the privacy community would respond to that, as would I think hopefully five of the Supreme Court, if the right case comes in front of them, based on something they ruled on about uh, uh, location tracking in the past mm -hmm. few years, mm -hmm. is that um, whether whether you have an expectation of privacy or not, which is the current test, I think the part of the question is, is that the right test right now? We live in a world where instead of occasionally having some vendors that have some records about us, we're generating reams and reams of incredibly revealing metadata every day in like many orders of magnitude greater than ever before. Records that reveal a pretty complete portrait of everything we're doing, even if you're not looking at the content of the communications. And uh, this is what Justice Sotomayor was writing about when in a recent case, um, uh, on this sort of, you've assumed the risk when you expose stuff to other people, you have no expectation of privacy on it. The court had previously held that uh, cops tracking your car as it moves through the city, um, using a little bumper beeper radio thing put on your car, 
didn't violate your reasonable expectation of privacy because, hey, you're on a public street. But in a case regarding a GPS tracker that basically comprehensively tracked a person's movements 24-7 for a period of months, uh, a majority of the Supreme Court said, you know what, actually that is qualitatively different and we are not ready to say that you don't have some sort of privacy interest that was violated by that. And I think that you can make an analogous argument to the internet where, yes, it may be that in discrete cases you are having an interaction with a third party, you have to assume the risk that they're going to hand that data over, but if you step back and look at the whole of it, like there's some sort of quantum of amount of metadata that is just too much because it reveals so much of your private activity. Just one quick follow-up. I, I don't remember seeing the level of outrage as a frequent traveler when they required positive ID to shift a positive ID to travel. I mean, it, the, the most basic right in this country is to go anywhere you want free of government intervention. <laughs> I didn't see... No, actually, yeah, please finish your, finish your thought. The actually, a board member, of, a board member and founder of EFF, John Gilmore, actually waged a many years war against the uh, ID requirement to travel. Yeah. Okay. Um, Good. Because they're analogous. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so I wanted. We, well, we will have more time for questions, but there's still another segment of content to talk about, which is the fight continues in Congress actually right now, and we need your help. Um, as as Kurt mentioned. In 2008, the Office of Legal Counsel of the Justice Department, the Justice Department's lawyers, wrote a report saying, we've looked at the NSL statute, and we don't actually think you can get these electronic communication transactional records, or as we in the business call them, ectors, which just goes to show how bad we are at communicating with the public. <laughs> um, the issue is, is that the statute's pretty poorly written. It has a section A that says, hey, provider, if you get a request for like basic subscriber information or toll records, or actors, you need to comply with it if you get one of these things under Section B. Section B, hey, FBI, you can issue requests for basic subscriber information and toll billing records. And then it doesn't mention actors. And so this, there's this weird disjunction in the statute where it seems to say you have to turn over actors, but then it doesn't actually authorize the FBI to ask for actors. And the lawyers at, at the OLC said, we have to read this like, as, as narrowly as possible. We think, we think that you can't get these, these records. You can only get basic subscriber information and toll records. Um, as Kurt said, the FBI disagreed with and has ignored that advice and continued to ask for electronic communications transactional records from a number of companies. Uh, we actually know, for example, uh, the gag on a Yahoo NSL. Yahoo got the gag lifted on one of their NSLs from 2013. It was released this year. It asked for actors. Um, but it became an issue when, in 2010, when this OLC report it was made public, the companies read that and said, ooh, we now have the Justice Department's own lawyers saying we don't have to hand over these records, so when you come to us with an NSL, we're going to say, see ya, we're not giving you those records, um, which uh, led to the FBI's first big legislative push in 2010 to, to fix this, what they call a typo, um, in the law uh, to give them access to the actors and so this is an issue i um i saw a great tweet cosplayers will appreciate that this that um glitter is the herpes of cosplay because you know it just keeps popping up whenever it comes out um actors are the herpes of surveillance law because whenever there is a discussion about any surveillance issue in congress the fbi tries to get actor in there um it came up in the context of the fisa amendments act renewal it came up in the context of patriot renewal um, it just keeps coming up. It almost blew up the USA Freedom Act as they were trying to jam it in there. Um, and now, as of 2016, uh, FBI Director Comey has said this actor fix is FBI's top legislative priority right now. Um, and that has led to two attacks on two fronts. First off, there's a bill called the Email Privacy Act, which we've been trying to get passed for over half a decade now, which basically stands for the basic proposition that the government should have to get a warrant if it wants your email. We thought this was a pretty easy ask considering we have an appeals court saying the Fourth Amendment requires them to get a warrant for your email and the DOJ never challenged that. Um, so it's basically the law that all big companies are following anyway. So hey, Congress, can you please make your statute not unconstitutional and clearly require a warrant for content? 
that passed the House unanimously earlier this year and went to the Senate and stalled in the Senate because there were enough votes on the Judiciary Committee there to add an amendment that would fix the Ector problem, which means that all the people who support the bill would withdraw their support because it suddenly turned it like, so basically we want this bill, but we're not willing to trade anything for it because we already basically have the status quo that we want anyway. But that means it's very easy for them to attach bad things to it, to kill it. And that's what has happened with the Email Privacy Act. Senator Cornyn had an amendment to add actors to the bill, to the, to the law. Um, and, and the Email Privacy Act, even though it was anonymously approved by the House, has stalled in the Senate because of that. Their other angle of attack has been through appropriations bills. And so there was uh, an amendment to the, uh, the Commerce and Justice Appropriations bills, the bills that fund the Commerce Department and the Justice Department and whatnot. Cornyn and McCain put forward an amendment, again, to add actors to what the FBI can get under an NSL. Um, there was a vote, a procedural vote. Often in the Senate, they need 60 votes for things to happen. Um, it was a vote of 58 yes, 38 no, and four not voting. So basically, we barely avoided it. One of the votes uh, no was actually the leader of the Senate because procedurally, if he wants to reserve his right to bring that up again, he needs to vote no. Um, and so, and people like Senator Feinstein, who's not on our side on these issues, were not in the room at the time. So if you look at the numbers, the numbers are really not good for us in the Senate on this issue, but they haven't had a great opportunity to bring it up yet uh, since that happened in the summer. And there aren't a whole lot of legislative days left. Um, and so I'd say it's maybe 50-50 that this is gonna come up again and they might get it through the Senate before the end of the year. But, but uh, assuming we get through safely this year, this is going to continue to be the FBI's top priority. And unless the composition of the uh, Senate changes, uh, we're going to be in a lot of danger of this happening next year, and it's going to be a top priority for us to stop. Because, uh, is there enough? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah got him. Great. Um, you have uh, you, you've been talking about the broad latitude that the executive branch has in, in interpreting the meaning of vectors, and I understand that as complex as as our executive system has become that it's reasonable to give them latitude of some degree in, in interpreting this statute. But doesn't this also, uh, doesn't the way the, the statute is written undermine the, the capacity of the uh, judicial branch to do that interpretation? As in, isn't this ultimately granting the executive branch judicial authority? So I, mean, uh, I think that, that is a problem with it, right? It, it is, uh, I don't, I don't for, well, first of all, I, I actually think the statute didn't give them the ability to interpret the uh, the meaning of actors they they just they just did it um, <coughs> and there was th the system say it's, it's flawed in terms of the separation of powers issue because it doesn't require a court to be involved unless in the very rare circumstance a uh, service provider uh, challenges it so for you know uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of times it is uh, an, an interpretation which has no judicial input. So it didn't give them the authority, they just took it. As we've seen sort of increasing unconstitutional powers granted to different law enforcement authorities, we've also seen an increase in the use of parallel construction. Uh, can you talk a little bit about parallel construction and how it intersects with NSLs uh, and how you see that use going forward in the future? Uh, parallel construction is uh, something that we talked about it a couple years ago when we did some panels about um, the FISA courts and the warrantless wiretapping from the NSA. And basically, for anyone that doesn't know, parallel construction is where uh, law enforcement, FBI, will get information perhaps through warrantless wiretaps or through uh, in NSL and then what they'll do is they'll hand it over to local law enforcement and they'll say look um, I'm over here and I'm looking for terrorists but I heard that there's going to be some drugs coming through um, yellow car 
they're going to meet up in, in at this truck stop and that's where the exchange is going to happen good luck with that and then what local law enforcement does is they will go and they'll make the arrest and then go back and say okay well had uh had i not known that this was going to go down from from the fbi what would i have done what i who would i would have talked to and they will go back and sort of do a parallel construction of the evidence that they would have needed to get the warrant or needed to be present um, and then whenever it gets handed over to me as a defense attorney I never know that anything ever came from the FBI all I know is that they had an anonymous tip or they talked to so-and-so and they had information that they needed to be at this truck stop at this date and this time looking for this car and this is a huge problem because I have a whole range of, of challenges that I would make if they received this information from the NSL that I wouldn't have if they had legitimately gotten the information the way that they've described. So parallel construction is, is a huge problem and as a defense attorney it's really hard sometimes for us to kind of figure it out. I haven't seen any cases myself just because of the types of cases that I work on but it's something it, it's it's very concerning and that was one of the things that um, uh, I was going to mention that it's just very, very problematic. I don't know if I've answered your question, but uh, uh, yeah, I, we have the stingrays are out there too, um, and so I think that there's just a lot of, yeah, I do see it getting worse. Yeah, stingrays are in particular kind of egregious because... Do we want to tell folks what stingrays are? Stingrays, uh, basically cell site simulators, which mimic a cell phone tower so people's cell phones will connect to them and then uh, basically tricking the phone into revealing its location and other information. So police will use them, and oftentimes they'll use them and they won't disclose that they're using them. Uh, and they'll actually form agreements with local governments saying, you know, if you want to use these, you know, these, this technology that we're using, or if you want the information, we'll share it with you, but there's a non-disclosure agreement. And you can't even, they'll actually, actually specifically mention the court, like you can't tell a court which is kind of blew my mind when I read that. It's like they're actually putting that in a contract that you can't tell a court. <laughs> so it basically prevents constitutional challenges and all sorts of things. It's similar to parallel construction. They're basically hiding the way they get the evidence, seeing if they can create the evidence another way that might be more defensible, I guess. And in they're, the de they're deploying those stingrays near protest sites. So if they know that there are people um, that are going to be protesting people. There are a lot of people there, a lot of people kind of coordinating using social media, text messages, things like that. They will deploy stingrays um, near those protests, which is obviously very concerning. Have any of you seen the movie Seven? Okay, because there's a good example of parallel construction in that, actually, where Brad Pitt, without a warrant, busts into the killer's apartment, and then they pay a like a homeless junkie on the street to like pretend to have been the tipster that gave them the probable cause to bust into the house. Mm -hmm. Anyway, being random. Uh, questions? Uh, so with the, the adoption of like smartphones and just the obscene amount of information that's given out daily, uh, with NSLs, what are the implications for like secondary or tertiary levels? Like I'm the target and I have had communications with individuals A, B, and C. Like, how far do those extend? Like if they look, okay, well this guy talked to person A and person A talked to A prime, B prime, C prime, like where do the tiers stop or how big of a web grows out just from a single yeah, I mean, I uh, point of impact? I mean, go ahead. Uh, so uh, w there are a couple of concepts that, that are there. One, one is a concept called the community of interest. So sometimes the government is asking of a telephone provider to get the community of interest, which is sort of the, the people that you're in frequent communication with uh, and sort of that, that circle. Um, and in, in other cases, uh, especially in national security context, uh, they, they're, just, they're getting a specific number of hops. So for, for a while, in, uh, uh, for call detail records, they were getting three hops. So that's who you call, who they call, who they call, and who they call. Uh, and that ends up being a lot of people, uh, especially if like one of those intervening calls <laughs> is something like to you know the the pizza delivery service. Uh, it can it can rise really expansively um, under uh, uh, some of the uh, 
uh, USA Freedom reforms that was ratcheted back to two hops, which is still an incredible uh, number of people. Yeah, actually, it's worth noting that there was a reform in the USA Freedom Act that directly applies to NSLs, which was after we saw this worrisome use of 215 court orders to get all the phone records, um, Congress basically said under, under Section 215 and under the NSL statutes, um, you cannot do bulk, that is indiscriminate collection of records. You actually have to have a specific identifier, you know, that is tied to what you're asking for. And so that somewhat addresses that concern. But in the Nick Merrill case too, the uh, exhibit or the attachment to the NSL, which was released or finally unredacted after 11 years, like that investigation had closed long before that got unredacted. But the government kept, they maintained their position that it's gonna affect ongoing investigations for other people. So that investigation for that NSL was done and over with, but then they kept maintaining and then the judge was like, after 11 years, you know, the NSL statute doesn't apply to uh, other investigations. Moreover, all the information was already in the public domain anyways. So, but the government continued litigating that for up to 11 years, it was amazing. Um, uh, supposedly, the intelligence community has a very tortured interpretation of what is classified as an intercept. In other words, they say they can intercept it, record it, decrypt it, data mine it, and it's only intercept if the artificially intelligent computer says, just a minute, Dave, I have something you want to look at, and only then do they need to get a warrant. Is that the case, and does that apply to the FBI or just the intelligence community? Um, so I think uh, one of the one of the concepts that was was is uh, part of the statute. Uh, I think what you're getting at is collection, uh, and the uh, intelligence community had a uh, well, I'll say a non-standard view of what collection is. Uh, that a human had to look at it before it was collected. So, uh, and they use some other terms like ingest or whatever to avoid using this loaded term collection. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, um, one of the directors of national intelligence was sort of describing it like a, a library filled with books, but it wasn't uh, uh, collected until you took the book off the shelf, which is sort of like, th that seems very weird. Like you'd be like over at, at his library and say, well, it's a nice collection of books you have. He goes, no, 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 that's not a collection. Uh, and this, this was a conscious avoidance of a statutorily, you know, charged term, uh, and they would like to have it be basically that, yeah, uh, algorithmic review doesn't count. Um, and, you know, that that's uh, uh, very disturbing, uh, that uh, as, as, you know, more and more of our, our lives are going online, more and more of this data is out there, uh, that, that algorithms will be reviewing it and then flagging when there's a, there's a, a problem is a significant change in how our society operates. I mean, to make a very sort of simple example, it would be uh, tremendously easy for the government to require in cars that if you ever exceed the uh, speed limit, you know, a modern smart car, uh, that it sends a note to the local police to say that you've been speeding. Uh, but I think as a society, we really don't want that. Like we're, we're comfortable with the notion that every once in a while someone is going to exceed the speed limit and even though you could have perfect enforcement by having this algorithm do it, that would go beyond what we would expect as a society. People would roll to get that. And I don't think we should be uh, uh, varying from that when we're talking about uh, doing the searches, uh, searches online. I think one more, one more, yeah. Um, yeah, I know you're trying to close the panel, so I'll keep it brief. Uh, I don't think canaries have been tested in court. Maybe y'all know about that. Um, can you make like specific canaries or like canary, like a multi-tier canary, throw it up on your website and be like, I haven't received an NSL that X, Y, and Z, um, and you just don't re-sign at the end of the month. If you do receive one, don't re-sign the parts that you did maybe receive. Uh, so this is about warrant canaries, the, the concept that uh, a, uh, it's, it's uh, legal and the, uh, the Department of Justice has conceded that it is legal that if you haven't received an NSL to say that you haven't received an NSL. Uh, that the gag only applies after you've received one, which is you know, a fairly sensible interpretation. Um, and uh, this has, has led to uh, a number of, of websites, uh, some libraries, other things to have things like uh, that you know NSLs uh, zero and we haven't received one. Uh, I, I think that the the best way to do it is to have a regularly issued transparency report listing 
uh, as much information as you're legally allowed to provide. So uh, each time you issue your transparency report, you say zero NSLs if you receive zero. And then uh, if you should happen to uh, get an NSL in the uh, uh, in, in a interim report, uh, that would be uh, an interesting test case to see whether uh, you can have compelled speech. Are you compelled to lie and continue to say zero? Uh, uh, can you just uh, 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 leave it blank and let people conclude from that what they may? Um, but uh, as sort of a, a final note on, on the canaries, some people have gone a little further than that and they have uh, sort of cute canaries, you know, they have uh, like a picture of a, of a canary and like it'll be replaced with one that's dead or disappear. Uh, I would say that like the cuter you get on that, the more that it looks like you're trying to hack the law and, and uh, you know, through the canary convey information that you are prohibited from conveying, the less of a good test case it, it, it becomes and the more it becomes about whether you were being too cute. Uh, so that's why I think regularly issued transparency reports say the most you're allowed to by law. And speaking of what's allowed by law, one of the important reforms in the USA Freedom Act from last year is that Prior to that, the statute didn't allow you to report whether you had received NSLs. Now you actually, by law under statute, are authorized to issue transparency reports saying that you've received NSLs. They just have to be in certain bands, like a band of like zero to 100, zero. zero to 99, 100 to 199. And the increments are like 100, 250, 500, and 1,000. And depending on which one of those four you pick, that, that def determines how sort of granular you can be about the type of legal process you got. But, but speaking generally, companies now have a statutory right to publish transparency reports about the NSLs they receive, Which and that is a good thing. And so there is hope, but there is also stormy uh, and skies and on the- I may just disagree with my colleague there. I also think that is unconstitutional license to speak, that the government shouldn't be uh, giving out licenses when it, uh, when it chooses to do so, requiring you to say zero and leave open the possibility that you haven't received one. Uh, so uh, that that reform, I think, is insufficient to keep the uh, or make the NSL statute constitutional. So I don't think we disagree on that. Uh, but You're saying uh, it was a good thing. It is a good thing. It is better than what was there. I also agree that the gag is still unconstitutional. And in fact, our organization has just put together a brief just yesterday on a gag issue where we agreed. But um, anyway, uh, please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you for coming. And, and watch the EFF.org site for, for action alerts about the Ector issue, because it is coming. <laughs>